But I really like that chorus. It says, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, and lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Amen. And every yes. day, that's why it says we should spend a thoughtful hour on the life of Christ that we may keep it always fresh in our minds. Amen. So our opening song is The Old Rugged Cross. We could stand to our feet and sing this together. Cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Let's sing this nice and strong all together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering. I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last.
time, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Tell my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. in the communion service with us, um, those who will be having it in their homes. Again, uh, another blessed opportunity to reflect uh, uh, both intellectually and physically to go through uh, the service that introduced to us <clears throat> that covenant of grace um, that Christ ratified with his own blood. You know, in preparing for this uh, particular service, there are a lot of things and the, the, the weight of the reverence, the solemnity, the seriousness, the, um, the testing, the humility that was brought out in um, seeking to really understand what the communion is about. And as I've mentioned, um, as we were going through the various nights, um, why so many people absent themselves from this particular service? They don't understand um, <clears throat> the significance of it. You know, the uh, cumbersomeness that they somewhat approach it. I don't want to go through this and, you know, you know, the foot washing. And, uh, and they sort of absent themselves from the service. Because the, 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 the real weight of it has never really been um, uh, taught concerning it. Um, communion service, that's generally the shortest sermon of the year. And uh, we come together and, and everyone is dressed in their robes and, and the formality and everything is set. But the significance and the preparation that is to intellectually and spiritually go into the service um, often people are not made aware of, of all that should be done prior to coming. Because again, we are told that in these sacred services that Jesus wants to be present through the operation of the Holy Spirit. He wants to be present with us, strengthening us that we may go away from this service. Um, edified and uplifted the way that God intends for us. The foot washing, the, the, it's, it's an ordinance, just as baptism is an ordinance. And it, the washing of the feet is symbolizing the washing of the heart that takes place through the operation and our confession and our acknowledgement of our need of grace. The partaking of the bread and the drinking of the juice, again, is to bring before our remembrance of the broken body that was again ratified, put in place because of Jesus' death. All that you and I have, we are told that even the blessings of this life has come as a result of the cross. Every loaf of bread, we are told, Every water spring is stamped with the cross of Calvary. Amen. And so all that you and I get to enjoy, it's all because of what Christ suffered for us. It wasn't an easy road for him to walk. It wasn't an easy road to wear the guilt and the shame. And you just think about, you, if you were falsely accused, if you think about uh, if, if someone would heap accusations upon yourself that was not true. If someone was to come into this room or we would see posted on social media things about us that we know are not true, we would do everything we could to defend ourselves. We would do everything we could to, to, to rectify the situation. Not, and, and again, we may want to do it because we don't want our family 
to wear shame and guilt for something that did not happen. And yet, brothers and sisters, Christ went to the cross bearing all of this for us, bearing all of this shame. And again, a service by itself, um, but as we learn uh, to take it in moment by moment, day by day, meditating on it, uh, uh, allowing our minds to run in that channel to recognize all that this service means to us as individuals. And so if you have your handouts, we're going to look at this handout this morning. Um, I'm going to have another word of prayer. And then by God's grace, we will uh, look to the Lord. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for another day, another morning, another opportunity for fellowship. We pray that in your own way, you know how to fill us. You know how to wash us and make us clean. You know those sins, those things that we must confess and forsake. You know the pride, self-sufficiency of our own hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us individually. Lord, that we would truly take in all that was done for us. That we would recognize that if it was just for me, if it was just for my brothers and sisters, individually alone in this room, you would still have sent your son. Such an expense was paid for us, but not with silver and gold, as Peter said, but with the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you, dear Lord, for an opportunity to sit before thee. We're praying for an opportunity, Lord, to Settle into thy truth, intellectually, spiritually, Father, that we cannot be moved by the slightest trial. But Lord, moment by moment, help us to love you. Help us to testify of your great grace and your great power. May we leave this room refreshed and strengthened to be a blessing to those who we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Amen. Again, brothers and sisters, we've been, for the last uh, three Friday evenings, we've been going through the communion service. One of the things that was brought out um, uh, in that particular study is how many people absent themselves from the service when it is God's intent that we would all be present. I was reading a particular quotation last night where uh, she talked about how in the early days of the Advent movement, when their numbers were few, they would come together or on Friday night, she said all the church, every church member was engaged in prayer and the searching of their hearts making sure that nothing was between them, their brethren, and God. And as they searched their hearts, and as they, they prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that God will reveal to them those hidden sins, where they have overreached in trade, where they have spoken words ill-advisedly, where they have spoken harsh words, because they wanted to put all of their sins away, because they wanted to come to the feast. The opportunity that you and I have is greater than that even of the disciples. See, brothers and sisters, when they came into the upper room feast, they were desirous of being the greatest. They had a desire to be served and not to be a servant. They went into that upper room feast unprepared to partake of that feast. And we are told that as they sat around, 
they looked upon each other and they were wondering, well, where's the servant? Where's, where's the individual who's going to come and, 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 and do the service? But when they saw Jesus get up and they saw him remove his garments and they saw him go over to that basin and get that water and they saw him go to every individual's feet, we are told that as Judas, as, as, as they watched the scene, they, they were, there were different thoughts running through different minds. But it says that when Judas saw Jesus grab that basin and begin to wash the feet, he had decided at that moment there was nothing to be gained being with Jesus. And he was fully intent on betraying him because he felt as though he was undeceived now. There was nothing to be gained from being with Jesus. Whereas the other disciples were broken, that someone they called Lord and Master was actually washing their feet. And their purpose that God was seeking to accomplish was accomplished by his actions. What could he more say to these individuals whom he had prepared? He was preparing to be the light of the world. He was preparing them to, to, to portray to the world a message, a, a, a display, a character that the world has not seen before. And yet here they were desiring to be the greatest, desiring to be the best. No one wanting to act a part of a servant. And if they would act a part of a servant, they would only act it upon someone whom they felt was worthy for them to be the servant of. Remember what we said, Judas was in this particular feast. And Judas, not, Ju not necessarily um, Judas per se, but in this uh, particular feast, Father in heaven, I pray that you would help me to um, receive the thought and allow you to speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. As they were there and as they were preparing for this uh, particular scene, there was something that Jesus wanted to accomplish. There was something that Christ is looking to accomplish for his people today. And the thought where we were going, it, it, it seems to escape me now. But I want us to notice. Matter of fact, let's go in our Bibles to the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke 13. We're going to come to our handout in a moment because we have we want to understand that there's a significance between the Passover and this particular service of how the reverence in which it is to be approached. There is a particular way and a particular mind frame that we must have in approaching this service. There's something that God is looking to accomplish for us, brothers and sisters. God has raised us up for such a time as this. Amen. And there's something that God is longing and looking to do. Yes, the thought came back. Thank you, Lord. Where we were saying that when you look at Judas or when you look at the disciples and we said that we would act a part of a servant but only upon those who we feel is worthy of our service. In other words, we will seek out those whom we really don't have anything against. And we will seek out those that, that we really feel comfortable with. But in actuality, in doing that, we are exemplifying the spirit that Satan really wants in the service to disrupt it. Because he is intending that you and I do not receive the refreshing and the strength from this service. And this is why she says that there may be a Judas in our presence. And she says, if Judas is there, she says the prince of darkness is also there. Because he has access to all those who will not yield to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit and angels are there. So we need not leave the service because Judas showed up. We need not leave the service without the blessing because God is here. 
on all such occasions. Christ is here through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we should earnestly plead for that blessing. We should make sure that as we are going and as we're looking, that we're searching our own hearts and that pride is not swelling up there. Because if Jesus could wash Judas' feet, if Jesus could wash any of the disciples' feet, then brothers and sisters, then we have no excuse. If Jesus would do that for them, uh, and brothers and sisters, if he was here, he would do it for us. Notice Luke 13. Luke 13. I just want to, uh, I'm sorry, Luke, John, it's John 13. John, pardon me. John chapter 13. <clears throat> and I want us to notice in Luke and John, John 13, not Luke. Looking at verse 1, the same solemnity that we find in the Passover is to be recognized in this service today. The Bible says in John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus, notice, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should, part, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And the supper being ended, and the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to do what? Betray him. Now, keep in mind, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is not writing in the present tense. He's writing as to what happened. So he's writing this and and you have to imagine as he's writing this, you know, if, if we were writing without inspiration, when we got to our part, we would color it a little differently. We would almost make it seem as though we did not do something and it wasn't as bad as an intent as it seemed. But under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes as it was. And so you can imagine as he's putting this in words, how his heart is breaking, that he's not writing this for his own diary, but he's writing this to give to the church. Here, this, this man of God, whom they look at as a father of the faith, is having to write. That Jesus I've been talking to you about, that Jesus that, that I had fellowship with, I also have to write and let you know that I ran out on him too. That when he needed a friend, I wasn't there. When he needed someone to pray for him, I wasn't praying for him. And so this is what John, under the inspiration of God, is having to write. And I'm sure is breaking his heart as he has to tell the church that I wasn't always this beloved John. I wasn't always this great apostle that you look at. I denied Jesus. I ran out on him when he needed me. When he, when, he, when he needed sympathy, I was not there for him. But guess what? He still loved us to the end. In spite of my failures of him, he still loved us to the end. And this confession makes Jesus even that much more desirable that you could do such a thing to him and he still loves you, it makes them want to love Jesus even more. And so the same way, brothers and sisters, our testimonies of our weaknesses does not make us weak. It actually gives God more glory. It actually shows God more, to be more compassion. It actually shows God to be more forgiving and more loving and more patient and more kind and long-suffering when we can testify of our weaknesses not to gain glory for ourselves, not to highlight the, the, the intricate details of sin, but to recognize our weaknesses. It shows God's strength to be greater because the Bible says that God's strength is made perfect, how? In weakness, brothers and sisters. Paul says, that's why I would, I would rather uh, a glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
He saw himself to be weak and God is allowing things to happen in our individual experience to show our weakness, to show our weakness. Notice what it says going on. John 13, he loved us even unto the end. Judas, he knew that Judas, the devil having put in the heart, having now put in the heart of Judas to Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray him. Verse three. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and he took a towel and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh to he, then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part in me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but what? but not all, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore he saith, ye are not all clean. This was the testimony that Christ made after the foot washing, because he came to Judah's feet and he lingered, we are told in inspiration, he lingered with Judas, but Judas had decided already in his mind, this can't be the Messiah based upon popular conceptions, based upon his own conception of what the Messiah would do, he said, this can't be him. He did not understand the plan of salvation. He did not understand the work of grace. He did not understand the mission of Christ. And it is due to these misconceptions, Desire of Ages, page 671, write this in your notes. It says, through false ideas, it says, through false ideas, that is how Satan gains control of the mind and he misshapes the character through false ideas of what Christ is to do. He misshapes the character. And so because of these conceptions that we have in our minds that is generally um, um, developed through hearsay and not necessarily through study and through surrender, even while professing Jesus, our characters can still be warped because we have to learn to read. And as we learn to study and we, we pray and we look at the life of Christ, when we see that our life is not in harmony with him, we cannot justify our faults by looking at the faults of others. We cannot, I was reading in Christ's object lesson, the chapter is under, the, the, the section is under talents and it says, that oftentimes we will look at others and we would see their sins. And then we would look at the fact that we did not commit, we do not commit such sins. And, it, and it's as if we would laud ourselves to think that we're better than them because we are not participating in that sin. She says, but what we fail to do is recognize that we are not doing what God has told us to do. Therefore, we are in a worse condition because it's not by them committing sin that we gain favor with God. God looks at us and says, and looks, 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 he looks at us and he says, as you have not done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So our neglect is offensive to God. God says, I would that you were what? Hot or cold. Maybe someone can 
change that AC. It's getting a little... But the reality is, it's starting to get a little cold. Yeah, amen. Yeah. So, but, but, but the thing is that we, want to, that we want to understand is that as we approach this service, we're not approaching it about him or about her or about them. It's about us. It's about us individually. Are we going to obtain all that God would have us to obtain? Now, look, look at your handout with me. Look at your handout. And those who are watching online, um, you can be able to find it on live stream. On live stream, there's a link there and you could just click it. And it says, is the blood on the lentil? Is the blood upon the lentil? Because just as when you look at Exodus 12, we're not going there. But when you look at Exodus 12, when God gave the instructions to Moses, for every individual household to prepare themselves for that final plague that was to come through the earth. Oh, pardon me, that was to come through Egypt. And they were given specific instructions for every household to perform. And what we see in the Passover pointing towards, because the Passover was, again, it was a commemoration of God's deliverance from Egypt because of the blood of Christ and their faith in the blood of Christ. But this service also pointed to the true lamb who would be the Passover and they found it in Christ. And so now Christ comes in the upper room and he says, I am the true lamb. And now I institute this service to commemorate that I have instituted the, the blood of the new covenant. And this now is to show forth my death till I come. So just as the Passover led us to the first coming, the communion is to point to the second coming. And this service is to be commemorated. And Paul says we ought to do it often. Not every time he suggests saying when we come together, but this is something that should be done often for the purpose of setting fast in our minds the blood of the new covenant. That blood that, 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 that Jesus confesses before the Father, that blood that when probation was about to close in Revelation 7, that blood that Jesus turned to the Father and said, my blood, my blood, my blood, my blood. And as a result of that confession, God says, hold the winds of strife until my servants are sealed in their foreheads. Look here with me in your handout. The directions that Moses gave concerning the Passover feast are full of significance and have an application to what? Parents and what? Children in this age of the world. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and he said unto them, draw you out, draw out, pardon me, and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover and you shall take a bunch of what? hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side poles with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will what? The Lord will what? Pass over the door and will not what? Suffer the destroyer to come in, in unto your houses to do what? Smite you. Now, brothers and sisters, this blood, a symbol of the blood of the lamb. We know Leviticus 17, 11 tells us that the life of the flesh is in the? Blood. This blood was a symbol of a spotless life, a lamb that was slain without blemish. Now, brothers and sisters, in Revelation 3, under the church of Laodicea, where do we see Jesus? We see Jesus doing what? Knocking at the door, endeavoring and desiring to come in. 
And so just like that Passover blood was upon the doorpost, here Jesus is to the last church wanting to be the Passover, knocking at the door of our hearts. And if Jesus comes in, then death will not be able to abide. And so this is what significance of the service. This is Jesus actually desiring to come into our hearts, actually desiring to set up camp, actually desiring to have this experience with us so that when death, now remember death came as a result of what? Sin. The law demands perfect righteousness of which we don't have. The law demands the life of the sinner. So when the law, as it were, knocks at the door, Jesus is there and Jesus doesn't present you, but he presents himself. Jesus presents himself as the substitute for us. And the assurance of salvation and redemption. And so as we receive Christ into the heart, not in a very careless manner of just a profession of faith, but an actual living faith that is carried out by faithful works. Are we together? Because yes, the blood was a beat to be upon the doorpost, but they were giving instructions that they now, when the blood was caught in that earthen vessel, and now that that blood was taken with a bunch of hyssop, that hyssop, that bitter herb, that David made reference to when he says, purge me with what? Hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This bitter experience of recognizing what our sins have caused. And we will only see sin for what it is in the light of what it cost to save us. We will never come to the point, brothers and sisters, of ever seeing the, the, the exceeding sinfulness of sin until we can recognize what it cost. The price that had to be paid, we will never see its deeds. The other day, my, uh, I've been telling my children, stop playing with the ball in the house. They said, it's a softball. And it, you know, and, and it broke one of, the, one of the shades in the home. And so I'm sitting there walking around, just kind of doing everything. And I'm like, how am I going to deal with this? You know, and they're looking like, yeah, the ball was soft. Okay, that's fine, but it's broke. Soft or not, it's broke. I said, ah, I got, a, I got an idea. You're going to pay for it. And you could have saw how big his eyes got like, I have to. And he just kind of walked around and looked, yes, that will solve it. The reality that these consequences have to be paid for. It brings a new appreciation for obedience. Amen. And so the reality is that oftentimes God puts us in positions to deal with our consequences, but it is always shielded by his grace. Because David says God has not rewarded us as our iniquities deserve. He gives us the strength to endure the trial. Just like what they're actually paying for, I gave them the money to pay for it. So the reality, brothers and sisters, even when we suffer for sin, God is giving us the strength to endure it. And when we recognize it, what does it do? It causes us to realize and appreciate the power of God even more. When it is His strength, Actually, that's actually helping us to endure the consequences of something that is not his. And so again, in our living, in, in our everyday life, we get to experience what Paul says, he was made to be sin for us, who knew no sin. That I might be made the righteousness of God by faith in him. Notice, back at your handout, notice what it says. Notice this part here, the second paragraph. It says, the father was to act as priest of the household. And if the father was dead, the what? The eldest son living was to perform this solemn act of sprinkling the doorpost with blood. This is a symbol of the work to be done in every family. Parents are to gather their children into the home 
and to present Christ before them as their one. The Father is to dedicate every inmate of his home to God and to do a work that is represented by the feast of the Passover. In what it says, it is perilous to leave this solemn duty in the hands of who? This peril is well illustrated by an incident that is related concerning a Hebrew family on the night of the Passover. The legend goes that the elder's daughter was sick, but she was acquainted with the fact that the lamb was to be chosen from every family and that its blood was to be sprinkled upon the lintel and side posts of the door so that the Lord might behold the mark of the blood and not suffer the destroyer to enter into, enter into smite the firstborn. With what anxiety she saw the evening approach when the destroying angel was to pass by, she became very restless. She called her father to her side and she asked, have you marked the doorpost with blood? He answered, yes, I have given directions in regard to the matter. Do not be troubled for the destroying angel will not enter here. The night came on and again and again, the child called to her father, still asking, are you sure that the doorpost is marked with blood? Again and again, the father assured her that she need, no, she need have no fear that a command which involves such consequences would not be neglected by his trusty, trustworthy servants. As midnight approached, her pleading voice was heard saying, Father, I am not sure. Take me in your arms and let me see the mark for myself so that I can rest. The father proceeded to the wishes of his child. He took her in his arms and carried her to the door, but there was no blood marked upon the lentils or the post. She trembled with horror as she realized that his home might have become a house of mourning. With his own hands, he seized the hyssop bow sprinkled the doorpost with blood. He then showed, he then showed the sick child that the mark was there. It says, are parents placing the mark of God upon their households? In, in this, their day of probation and privilege? Are not many fathers and mothers placing their responsibility into others' hands? Do not many of them think that the minister should take the burden and see to it that their children are converted and that the seal of God is placed upon them? Do they not restrict their children's desires, referring them to a thus saith the Lord? Many suppose that the Sabbath school influence will be all sufficient and that the Sabbath school teacher will instruct and educate their children in such a way as to lead them to Christ. Fathers and mothers place their responsibility in the hands of others and thus perilously neglect their own households. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 9. Notice what it says, brothers and sisters, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Brothers and sisters, as I read that, I often wonder how many generations pass until they stopped feeling any significance for the Passover. Because I'm sure that first night there was, there was anxiety in every home. I'm sure that they, even though the instructions were given by Moses and even though they have seen God working, when that night came, I'm sure that they all stared at that firstborn. I'm sure they all huddled around. I'm sure the father actually went and gazed uh, periodically throughout the night, making sure that, that it wasn't dried up. 
that it was still there, that it can be seen. Maybe, maybe in his, in his uh, un unrestfulness, maybe he actually put a thicker batch on. But the reality was there was an anxiety because it showed their faith in the promise of God. Amen. It showed that they actually believed and it brought about a godly fear. But I wonder how many generations actually pass before they stop seeing any significance. And they looked down and they said, wow, well, it's there, it's there. I did it, or somebody did it. But the significance of the service was gone. To the point where now here we are today in the Lord's Supper, having the same weight and the same significance upon the people of God today, and it has lost its significance to us. Doesn't mean much. If we do it, we do it. If we don't, we don't. No big deal. Not understanding, brothers and sisters, as we, as we were reading last night, this is a test. This is a test for God's people today. Amen. This act of humility, it is a test for us. Do we accept the example that was set down for us? Notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9, and again, this is introducing to us that that blood was, it was a seal. It was a sign. Notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 9, and look what it says in verse 1, reading down to verse 6. This was after Ezekiel 8, where the people turned their backs on the sanctuary truth. And as it were, they were looking out into the world. And the Bible says, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 1, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was what? Clothed in linen. With a writer's acorn by his side, he went in and he stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, which had the writer's acorn by his side, and the Lord said unto him, do what? Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that what? Sigh. And that what? Cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye what? Spare. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Verse 6, slay utterly old and young, both maids and what? Children. Women, but come not near any upon whom is what? The mark and where? Does he begin? Get at my sanctuary. Then he began at the ancient or these responsible men of duty which were before the house. Now, brothers and sisters, as those who have been called into authority, just as Moses instructed the elders and as the elders weren't to instruct the people, there is a solemn responsibility that those who occupy leadership positions are to instruct others on how to receive the mark of God. Because again, if anything was neglected, that home would have been touched. So they had to make sure they heard everything Moses said. Moses was a prophet, amen? Yes. They had to take what the prophet said and they had to now distribute it to the people and make sure that none of the details were lost. So that every home that would, that would recognize the claims of God could be spared of what was about to happen. And so we today are to be instructed on everything that you and I are to do in order to receive the mark of God. In order to receive the approval of God. 
Because after the sealing takes place, we are told that these slaughter angels, which is a symbol of the plagues, are going to follow. Notice, go back to your handout. Notice, go back to your handout. I am much distressed. Last paragraph, front page. I am much distressed because there is such manifest neglect in the home in the matter of what? Training the children and the youth, even in professedly Christian homes where fathers and mothers would be, would be supposed to be diligent students of the scriptures in order that they might know every specification and restriction in the word of God, there is manifest neglect of following the instruction of the word and of bringing up the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Professionally Christian parents fail to practice what? Piety at home. How can fathers, turn it over, how can fathers and mothers represent Christ's character in the home life when they are content to reach a cheap, low standard? The seal of the living God will be placed upon those only who bear a what? Likeness to Christ's character. If parents would fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to be there, if parents would fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to be their strength, they would not fail of what? Receiving. His blessing in their households. Those, those scriptures, I want you to read them later. Notice what this next paragraph is. The reason why children, reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that the generation, that the generation rose up that had not been what? instructed. Let me read that again. The reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that the generation rose up that had not been instructed concerning the great deliverance from Egypt by the hand of Jesus Christ. Their fathers had not rehearsed to them the history of the divine guardianship that had been over the children of Israel through all their travels in the wilderness. The Lord Jesus had given special instructions from the pillar of the cloud, bringing before who? Parents. The responsibility of teaching their children the statutes and the commandments of God. They were to present to their children tokens of the power of God and to perform ceremonies that would provoke inquiry and give them an opportunity of repeating the works of God and dealing with his people. But the parents had failed to act the part that God had assigned them in diligently teaching their children so that they might have been intelligent in regard to the works of God and leading his people through the wilderness. Had the parents been true to their trust, the children would have seen the mercy and goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the parents neglected the very work that the Lord had charged them to do and failed to instruct them in regard to God's purpose toward his chosen people. They did not keep before them the fact that idolatry was a sin and that to worship what? Other gods meant to forsake Jehovah. If parents had fulfilled their duty, we should never have the record of the generation that knew not God and were therefore given into the hands of the spoilers. Isn't it a wonder why we have a generation today that if you were to ask them about Adventism, they have no idea how it started. Generically, they have no recollection of its divine attesting to. And they now can echo from the desk, from print and from lifestyle. We know too much about, we hear too much about our pioneers. We talk too much about them. This is what they're saying now. 
But again, we look at this generation and we say, yes, they're in apostasy, but it started somewhere. We don't go back far enough. We don't go back to the root. There's a root cause that has brought about this generation that know not God. And it's evident, brothers and sisters. And, the, the, and, and where we fall short is, is that we are trying to reform, but we're trying to bring back a 1970 religion. We're trying to bring back ultra conservatism. If we don't have drums, if we don't have this, then we got present truth. It's not present truth. So a lot of churches don't have drums. A lot of churches don't have this. A lot of churches don't have that. But it's not present truth. So we have to go, we have to understand from whence we are fallen. And we have to repent and do the first works. But we're trying to do a patchwork just until Jesus comes and he'll fix it. Just put a patch on it. Let it just hold it to the second coming. And when, the, when Christ comes, he'll, he'll just fix it anew. Just, just keep it moving. And that's, all, that's what we're trying to do. And that is evident because that's what we're trying to do in our own lives. We're just trying to keep up the facade long enough till Christ comes and nobody knows it. Just keep the facade going. Just, just keep it up. Let everyone keep thinking that we're doing what's right. Let everyone keep thinking that we're, we believe present truth. The camera's on, so we got to make sure everything is right. It's Sabbath. We got to put our best on. But when it comes to the days of the week, that's when it's really seen that Sabbath was a facade. It was, it's a facade. And the Spirit of God cannot bless these artful dissimilings. There has to be deep repentance, a deep breaking up of our hearts so that when we come together, guess what? We are strengthening each other and we're not trying to outdo everyone's performance. We're not trying to get Oscars on Sabbath. We're actually trying to just manifest and declare what God has been able to do with us throughout the week. We have testimonies to bear. Lively ones, of the, because we have seen the Spirit and the power of God working for us. If it's just been and keeping our minds fixed on Jesus. I want to end here. Notice what it says. In the New Testament, we are exhorted to be warned. We are exhorted to be warned by the example of the Hebrews in neglecting their duty and in departing from the living God. Now are these things, now all these things happen to them for in samples, and they are written for what? Right. Our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The failures and the mistakes of ancient Israel are not, pardon me, are not as, let me read that again. The failures and the mistakes of ancient Israel are not as grievous in the sight of God as are the sins of the people of God in this age. Whoa. Who professes to be the people of God? Seventh-day Adventists. They may look at us and say, you guys, you, you know, you're offshoots. You're not a part of the conference. Never mind that. The reality of it is we profess to be the people of God. Therefore, regardless of where we, what cubby holes we sneak into, guess what? You profess to be the people of God and your sins are more offensive to God than ancient Israel. I'm a reform SDA. I'm a free SDA. I'm a, I'm a SDA. I'm a shepherd's rod. Doesn't matter where you profess to go. I'm in the comp. It doesn't matter. Laodicea. God is not pleased. And if you say that you're something else and you're the people of God, then that makes you even more Laodicea. That makes us even more in a worse condition. And so the reality is it, ancient Israel is not as offensive to God as who? As we are. We have to read the Bible with a different context. Man, look at these Pharisees. Have mercy, Lord. Look at me. Man, look at what Judas did. Wait a minute, Lord. As I start thinking about it, I'm like Judas. Zyvagus says when Judas came to Jesus, he loved him. 
says that Judas desired, that, Ju Ju that Judas believed that through association with Jesus, he could be changed. Don't we all profess that? We all have that quality. But when temptation came, when temptation comes, it shows whether or not we love Jesus or do we love self more. And every time we give in to self, it shows that we love self more than God. And guess what? We are worse than Judas. Whenever you get that urge, I'm going to tell them, I'm going I'm to let you know how I feel. That's self. That's, that's, that's self. I'm going to, when you retaliate, that's self. It says, light, are we there? Light has been increasing from what? Age to age. And the generation that follows, follow, have the example of the generations that went before. The Lord does not change. And the sin he condemned in former generations should be what? Voided by us. We should heed the admonition that has been given in the past. Lay hold of the promises that are that are made for the encouragement of the obedient. If we are learning lessons in obedience, follow the path of faith and virtue. We have a living connection with God and he will be our strength and support, our, our front guard and our reward. The same conditions must be fulfilled by us now as were, as were by those who received rich blessings in former days. The reason we do not have more of the blessing of the Lord is that the professed people of God serve him with divided hearts, as verily as did ancient Israel. They profess to be worshipers of God, but many as verily worship the idols as did the Hebrews. With every generation increased light has shown and we are responsible for the use that we make of this light. Those who pretend to serve God and yet cherish selfishness, who seek to fulfill ambitious projects, are lovers of pleasure, lovers of self, and are as much and are as much more sinful than was ancient Israel, as the light is greater which shines upon their pathway. They have the past experience in the history of the disobedient Israel, and they know the result of their, neglect, of their neglect of duty. They have heard warnings from God as to how to avoid the mistakes and errors of his ancient people in order that they may escape the results of their own course of action. And they are more inexcusable in their course of sin than was ancient Israel. Many feel astonished that the Israelites should have manifested such ingratitude when God had manifested such love and care for them. They think that they would not be guilty of taking such a course, but let the question be turned upon ourselves. How much gratitude do we render to God for his loving kindness and tender mercy? How easy is it for us to forget God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. We each come under the condemnation that rests upon ancient Israel when we neglect to give thanksgiving to God for his daily mercies to us. When the leper returned to give glory to God, Christ asked, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Is there only one in 10 who returns to give glory to God? Is this the portion who return with overflowing hearts to render praise and thanksgiving for the mercy and loving kindness of our Heavenly Father? Is blood upon the lintel, brothers and sisters? Are we prepared for God to pronounce upon us, ye are all clean? He says, you're all clean, but not all. And the not all is not arbitrary. It's not a decree. 
is not something that has to be said. It's conditional. You're not clean. That's a, con that's a conditional phrase. It's not arbitrary. It's not, it's, not a, it's not something that God has determined to be said when we come together. God wants us all to be clean, brothers and sisters. God wants us all to, to be reconciled to him and to each other. God wants us to put sin and self away. What would divide us this morning? What would divide you? What would divide me? That's to be surrendered. That's when we go into the foot washing, we're not going in there to surrender. We've surrendered. Just like we don't get baptized to get forgiven. We don't get baptized to, to, to live for Christ. We get baptized to declare that I am Christ. And we're being washed, brothers and sisters, to declare that I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior from sin. I've acknowledged his blood. I've acknowledged the fact that that sin that I have committed, that I've been committing, those feelings and harsh attitude that I've had towards my brothers and sisters, that for that sin, Jesus died. That's what Jesus died for. He died for those harsh words that I spoke to my brother. He died for those harsh words that I spoke to my wife. Those harsh words that I spoke to my children. Those harsh words I've confessed. I've acknowledged them. Those harsh words that I've spoke to my boss, to my supervisor. Those dirty looks that people got from me. She says that if Jesus had looked, had presented an angry look, the plan of salvation would have been lost. Lord, for those looks you die for. And I surrender them to you, Jesus. I give them all to you. And this is how we enter that service clean. 